Coming up on this Thursday edition of Newsline at Noon. For the first time since they were separated during the Korean War over six decades ago, some 80 South Koreans will reunite with their family members at the North Mount Gumgang Resort over the next three days. Korea's figure skating queen Kim Yana inches closer to back-to-back -back Olympic golds after placing first in the women's short program with a score of 74.92. First Ukrainian President Viktor Yanukovych and the opposition agreed to a truce after the country seized the worst unrest in its post-Soviet history. While the US has warned of consequences, the EU is considering sanctions on Kiev. These stories are more on Newsline at Noon. Thanks for joining us. You're watching Newsline at noon. I'm Choi Yuzan in Seoul. Very good to have you with us. I'm Mark Broom. Now, we are just a few hours away from seeing a rare round of reunions for families separated since the Korean War take place at North Korea's Mount Gumgang Resort. And this will be the first uh, reunion event in three years and four months and is being seen as an important turning point for inter-Korean relations. Yes, uh, Moon Gon Young joins us live now from the northernmost tip of South Korea near the heavily fortified border in Gosong Gangwon province. Gon Young. Hi guys, um, I'm standing right here on the southern side of the inter-Korean border in Kusong. Now, this is the northernmost tip in South Korea before the border line and pretty much uh, the closest to North Korea as any civilians can get. Now, if you look right behind me, 1.7 kilometers behind me is the military demarcation line where just about half an hour ago, the 82 South Korean elderly who will be meeting their relatives in North Korea cross the heavily fortified border into North Korea for the first time in 64 years. Now also to my right, if you see right behind me, uh, 22 kilometers from here is the Mount Kimgang Resort, the very venue of this very emotional humanitarian event, the reunions, which will start taking place later today. So, Kanyang, are the group of South Koreans meeting their relatives in the north on their way to the Mount Kimgang Resort as we speak? No. Now, um, in fact, yes, uh, they are. They actually crossed the border about half an hour ago, like I said. And uh, from here, they will be traveling to the North Mount, uh, North Korea's Mount Kimgang Resort. Now, um, if all goes well at about 1, 1 or 1.30 p.m., they will be arriving in North Korea's Mount Kimgang Resort. And at 3 p.m., the reunion will begin. However, um, you know, many of them, I must remind you, are in their 80s and 90s, uh, the elderly. And um, when I met them earlier today, about half, an hour and a half ago, at the Inter-Korean Transit Office, um, many of them said that they could not sleep last night because of excitement due to, you know, excitement for meeting their relatives, brothers and sisters and children for the first time in 64 years. In fact, um, the, the schedule was delayed because uh, two of the female members needed medical attention and are actually being um, being ambulanced to North Korea for the journey. Of course, the South Korean Red Cross is traveling with them along with the chief of the Red Cross, Yoo Jung Gun, and a dozen me medical personnel, including ambulances, to take, uh, take a look or look after their um, health issues. Well, it really isn't that surprising that some of them are overwhelmed with the emotion of the day. They've been waiting and hoping for this day for so long now. What does their schedule look like from now on? Now, like I said uh, before, they will start their first reunion. This will be the first face-to-face -face reunion uh, between the relatives and uh, the South Koreans at 3 p.m. And then that will last for about an hour or so. And then they will part their ways and uh, go back to their rooms. And at about uh, 5 to 6 p.m., they will have dinner together. Afterwards, they will have private time in their rooms. However, 
um, that's not to say that they will be able to spend the rest of their stay there, three days stay there with their relatives. Um, the, the event or the meeting will be spanned out in six different occasions for a total of 11 hours. OK, well, Konyang, well, hopefully um, we see more of these reunions in the future. It's great news that they did actually agree to hold these reunions at this point now. And hopefully we'll get to a point where all divided families on the peninsula can one day see their relatives uh, before it's too late. Right. All right. Uh, thank you, Kanyang. That was our Moon Kanyang live from Kosang, the northernmost tip of South Korea near the eastern inter-Korean border. A top Chinese official who visited Pyongyang this week is scheduled to arrive in Seoul later on this Thursday, raising speculation that progress is being made in international efforts to denuclearize North Korea. An official at the South's foreign ministry confirmed Chinese vice foreign minister Liu Zhenmin's three-day visit to Seoul until Saturday, where he will meet with a number of officials here, including the chief negotiator to the six-party nuclear talks. Liu's trip to Pyongyang has been closely watched, especially since it came after the top diplomats of Beijing and Washington recently said they exchanged proposals on ways to spur the North to disarm its nuclear weapons. And whatever was discussed between the two ministers was likely relayed to Pyongyang by Liu, and he's expected to give details of his trip to North Korea in Seoul. And in the spirit of strengthening diplomatic and strategic ties between Seoul and Beijing, 40 Korean lawmakers left for a four-day visit to China this Thursday morning. The parliamentary group, the largest ever for, from Korea to visit China, is scheduled to meet with Chinese President Xi Jinping and chairman of the National People's Congress Standing Committee, Zhang Dejiang. In their meeting with Jiang, the Korean lawmakers plan to discuss a range of inter-Korean issues, along with ways to foster more exchanges between the two countries' parliaments. The Korean lawmakers will also visit the free trade zone in Shanghai before returning home Sunday. Seoul and Moscow are reportedly in talks to export Russian natural gas to Korea through China. In an interview with Itar Tass News Agency, Russian Energy Minister Alexander Novak said exporting Russian gas to Korea was one of Moscow's major pending issues. The minister said that after Russian gas giant Gazprom assessed two possible routes to export gas, constructing, constructing pipes to Korea through China and under the West Sea would be more feasible than from Vladivostok and under the East Sea. He added the route is still under review as it requires cooperation from China. The first group of survivors from the Egypt bus bombing arrived back in Korea on Wednesday extremely tired and emotional. Three members of their tour group and the Egyptian bus driver were killed last Sunday when a suicide bomber blew up their bus near the Egypt-Israel border. Kim Yeon bin reports. Three days after the horrifying attack on their tour bus, the first group of Korean tourists arrived back on home soil Wednesday after their ill-fated trip to Egypt. Looking exhausted, the victims underwent medical checks upon their arrival to check on their physical health and state of mind. We did basic checkups. This included checking their body temperature and blood pressure. The first group were the lucky ones, only suffering scratches and bruises. The mental scars, however, will not go away so easily. I heard gunfire, so we crouched down, but smoke and fire started to break loose. After going through immigration, the group boarded a bus bound for Chincheon, their hometown in Korea's central Chungcheongbuk-do province. The remainder of the group is due to arrive home on this Thursday. The families of the three Koreans who were killed are currently in Egypt and will be accompanying their bodies home soon. In the wake of the attack, the Korean government has issued a travel warning for the Sinai Peninsula and is working to find out whether there are still Korean tourists in the region. The tour group's bus was traveling from St. Catherine's Monastery, a popular tourist destination in the South Sinai, to Israel when it was attacked last Sunday. An Al-Qaeda-inspired terrorist group in the region claimed responsibility for the attack and has since warned all tourists to leave the area or risk further attacks. Kim Bin, News. 
Prime Minister Chong Hong Won has vowed to get to the bottom of Monday night's fatal building collapse in Korea's southeastern city of Gyeongju that killed 10 people and injured some 100 others. At an emergency meeting of related ministers this morning, the Prime Minister ordered a thorough investigation into the cause of the incident, punishment for those found accountable and safety inspections of similar facilities throughout the country. The state police agency plans to look into whether lax management of the Gyeongju resort and illegal construction approval could have been factors in the deadly collapse. Police plan to summon up to 30 people for questioning. For your fill of Korean and international news, join Che Yu Sun and Mark Broom every weekday at lunchtime. Newsline at noon. Plenary session this Wednesday and vote on the government restructuring bills. After two days of deadly clashes in Ukraine, the government and protesters say they're ready to lay down their weapons and talk. President Viktor Yanukovych has agreed to a truce with the opposition leaders, but the question is, how long will it last? Our Shin Semin reports. Embattled Ukrainian President Viktor Yanukovych announced late Wednesday that he had agreed to a truce with leaders of the nation's top three opposition parties after street violence killed 26 people and injured hundreds of others the day before. On his official website, Yanukovych said his administration and the opposition had agreed to negotiate to end the bloodshed and stabilize the situation in the interests of social peace. While a step in the right direction, there are lingering doubts about whether the truce will hold. The government and opposition have held talks before, as recently as last week when protesters agreed to clear out of City Hall and downtown streets. However, the goodwill came to an end with the street violence Tuesday. President Yanukovych's announcement came less than a day after police charged at protesters in Kyiv's Independence Square, causing hours of clashes. Earlier Wednesday, the United States, France and Germany reacted to the violence. The United States condemns in strongest terms the violence that's taking place there. I'd like once again to underline the seriousness of the Ukrainian situation and remind you we have decided regarding tomorrow's meeting of foreign affairs ministers. The foreign ministers of France, Germany and Poland are scheduled to visit Ukraine on Thursday to meet with Yanukovych and opposition leaders. In another development, Yanukovych fired his army chief Wednesday as thousands of opposition protesters blocked barricades in the capital, and the military announced a nationwide strike. Shin Zemin, Arirang News. The United States has reiterated its calls on Korea and Japan to resolve their historical and territorial differences through dialogue. At a press briefing Wednesday, U.S. State Department spokesperson Marie Harf said Washington will encourage its two key regional allies to cooperate in the name of maintaining peace and stability in Northeast Asia. However, Harf refused to comment on remarks made by Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe's special advisor Eto Seichi, who earlier this week criticized the U.S. for expressing disappointment over Abe's visit to the Yasukuni War Shrine in December. Harf only said that Washington's efforts to get Seoul and Tokyo on better terms would not be swayed by such a view from a Japanese official. Japan is intensifying efforts to lobby against bills to also use the name East Sea for the body of water between Korea and Japan after two lawmakers from the U.S. state of New York introduced the bills to the state legislature. The lawmakers Toby Stavisk and Edward Braunstein say they received a letter from the Japanese Consulate General in New York opposing the dual use of the name East Sea in all new school textbooks. The letter said the U.S. State Department has used the Japanese name Sea of Japan as the official name, so both names are not necessary. The lawmakers' offices also said they received about 20 emails from Japanese people protesting the bill. The lawmakers presented the bills to the two houses of the legislature after the state of Virginia recently passed a similar bill. Now, the historical and territorial differences that divide Korea and Japan are very clear to those at the centre, but to the outside world, the disputes can be rather confusing and the emotion can be 
un underestimated. To give the international community a better understanding of where Korea is coming from, the government and civic groups are attempting to improve Korea's brand image. Gwon Soa reports. Hundreds of people, mainly students, gathered Wednesday at the opening of the exhibition Brand Image Up, hosted by Yonhap News Agency and the Voluntary Agency Network of Korea, or VANK. The so-called cyber diplomatic organization uses its time promoting the country and improving Korea's brand image globally. They focus on reporting the truth about issues like Japan's claims to Korea's Tokto Island, the naming of the East Sea and the women forced into sexual slavery by the Japanese military during World War II. As, as I'm Korean, I want other people, not even South Korean, but other foreigners to know what is right about South Korea and that's what I'm volunteering for. I believe that informing foreigners about our country is the best way to improve Korea's status. Park Gi-tae, the founder of VANK, which has 12,000 members, says his dream to give the world a better understanding of Korea began with a pen pal letter. One of Park's foreign friends told him that maps abroad identify Korea's East Sea as the Sea of Japan and refer to Korea's Tokdo Island by what the Japanese call it Takeshima. So I'm been upset. So I send email, this is wrong, Shobo Japan is wrong, Takeshima is wrong, it's Tokdo and East Sea. To bring about change, VANK began to send letters to foreign media outlets and foreign governments asking that they change their textbooks and maps. Korean singer Kim Jang-hun, who is a member of VANK, expressed his thoughts on improving Korea's brand image. Although I am a singer, I founded a website called truthoftokdo.com and also an application. We shouldn't fight with foreigners about Tokdo, but prove it in a logical way by showing them evidence. The exhibition runs through February 25th at the National Museum of Korea, aiming to spread the idea that all Koreans are ambassadors representing their nation. Kwon Soa, Arirang News. Most of Koreans were up into the wee hours of the morning to watch figure skating queen Kim Yana's first performance at the Sochi Olympics. Yeah, and she certainly delivered on all the high expectations, turning in a really breathtaking performance in the short program, inching that step closer to securing what could be historic back-to-back -back Olympic gold medals. And for details on Wednesday night's performance, we connect live to our Olympics correspondent Song ji -san in Sochi. So, Ji-san, we don't want to get too ahead of ourselves here, but Kim got off to a perfect start. Hello, guys. The IOC's official website announced Wednesday there was Yona time, and it was Kim skating that showed the world that she was determined to go out on top in Sochi as a multiple world and Olympic champion. With jumps of huge scale and exquisite expressions like no other, Kim skated an almost flawless program to the music, sending the clowns, to lead the short program at 74.92 points. That's about four points short of a world record she set in Vancouver four years ago. But some are saying she should have received a higher score as her skate was clean, earning her the highest program component score here at Sochi that grades her artistic expression. Although Kim had no trouble landing her triples, Kim told reporters after her performance that she was a bit tense just before her turn, but she believed in herself and was relieved after her jumps landed successfully. After her short program performance, fans were even more convinced Kim will defend her Olympic gold to become the only third female skater in history to win two consecutive Olympic golds in this highly competitive event. I'm really happy that she got the best score in the game, and I wish her more luck in the next game. First of all, it was inspiring. I, I, I think she will win. <laughs> But Kim needs to widen or at least maintain the gap between her and the runners-up as the top three are within a single point of each other. 17-year-old Russian Adelina Sonnikova fascinated home fans with a stunning performance and is just 0.28 points behind Kim. Italian Caroline Costner also skated with great grace to Ave Maria to put her in third place, just 0.8 points short of the top spot. 15-year-old Russian skating sensation Yulia Dimitskaya sits in fifth place after failing to land her last jump. Korea's two other skaters, Kim Hye-jin and Park Soo-yeon, also advanced to free skating on Thursday 
a day as they qualified in the top 24. Park Soo-yeon is the first to skate the long program on Thursday at 7 p.m. Sochi time, and that's midnight Korea time. Kim Yuna will be the last, skating her last free program, dancing to the tango, Adios No Nino, bringing the curtain down on an unparalleled skating career and saying one last goodbye to her fans. So once again a reminder, Kim will be skating in the early hours of Friday morning Korea time. Let's all cheer her on and help her win a historic gold in Sochi. That's all for me from now, reporting from Sochi Media Center. Back to you guys. All right, thank you, chi -san. That was our Song ji reporting live from Sochi on Kim Yeon-ah's stunning performance Wednesday night. Yes, and best of luck to her tonight, too, in the long program. Looking forward to watching that. Now we're going to check in with our sportscaster, SJ, for more on Kim's performance and the rest of the day's Olympic news. The wait is over as we finally got a chance to watch Kim Yana compete in the women's figure skating event in Sochi. And she didn't disappoint as she delivered what Michelle Kwan described as breathtaking. And as the figure queen performed in her last Olympic short program of her illustrious career, she scores a season best 74.92, good for first overall. And despite it being lower than her Vancouver score of 78.50, her performance left many experts speechless as she hopes to claim her second straight gold on day 13. Meanwhile, Park so finished with 49.14 and Kim Ajin finished with a final score of 54.37. And staying with the women's figure skating event, while Kim Yana shined on ice, all eyes were on Yulia Nimnishkaya of Russia and Mao Sada of Japan once the figure queen's performance was over. And despite it being considered Kim Yana's biggest threat, Nimnishkaya falls in one of her jumps and was deducted a point. And with that, the final score of 65.23 was far lower than her team figure skating result as she finishes fifth overall. And as for Mao Sada going very last in the event, she falls in one of her jumps once again as she scores just 55.51 in her short program, good for 16th overall. Meanwhile, it was another Russian skater who came neck and neck with Kim Yana as Adelina Sonikova scores 74.64, just short of Kim Yana's final score. And while women's figure skating consists of some of the youngest Olympians, one Olympian proved that age doesn't matter when it comes to the Olympics as Ole Aina Bjorndalen became the most decorated winter Olympian of all time. And now after helping Norway win the first Olympic mixed relay in biathlon, he won his 13th medal at the Winter Games, becoming the most decorated winter Olympian of all time. The 40-year-old has now won eight gold medals, four silvers and a bronze and has a shot at another medal on Saturday. And speaking of making history, U.S. bobsledder Lauren Williams made history on day 12 after becoming the fifth athlete to win both the Summer and Winter Games medal. After winning a gold medal with the U.S. track relay team in London, Williams competes in the two-man bobsleigh event and wins a silver medal for Team USA as she becomes just the fifth athlete to win both the Summer and Winter Games medals. And finally, taking a look at the medal count so far after 12 days of competition in Sochi. Of course, if we take a look at here, we have a new first place here. Norway in first place now after adding another gold medal for a total of nine. Germany still with eight gold medals in second with the U.S. in third, followed by Russia and the Netherlands. Meanwhile, Korea drops down to 16th overall with two gold, one silver, and one bronze medal. And that's going to wrap it up for me. This has been SJ. Have a great rest of the day and see you guys again for your sports needs. Okay, weather time. Let's get an update on the weather with our Ijeon at the Weather Center. Hello there, Jian. Great afternoon, Mark and Yusan. Jian, it's mm. a big day for people taking part in the family reunions today, right, but right. I, I heard a snowy day is in, in the forecast for Mount Kumgang. Is that right? That's right, Yusan. It's been snowing Mount Kumgang since last night, and it will snow all day long today. And also, Gangwon-do and parts of Gyeongsang Bukdo province will receive snow throughout the day. But it looks like early spring weather will continue to dominate in the rest of the country as the nation can expect slightly milder conditions compared to yesterday. Also, it looks like
like partly cloudy, morning will make way for sunny skies as we go through the day. And Sochi, which is hosting Winter Olympics, will have a mostly sunny day with a high of 16 degrees Celsius. With that, let's take a closer look at the readings for Korea. The afternoon high in Seoul will get up to 6, while Daegu will see a high of 9, and Busan will top out at 10 this afternoon. Now let's see how other regions are looking. It looks like Jeju and Daejeon will climb to 8, and Mount Kungang will remain on the freezing side with daily highs of minus 8. Now that's all for me today and let's send it back to Mark and Yusan in the studio. Well, thank you very much for the weather there, Jian. And those are the stories we're following at this hour. As we mentioned at the top of the newscast, there are reunions happening today, so Arirang News will be bringing you coverage on that all throughout the day. Right. Uh, Mark and I will be back here tomorrow for Newsline at noon. Join us then. Thank you.